All right, this last section in chapter six should go pretty quickly. These are just applications of linear transformation and using matrices to transform points in R2. So we had done some of this at the beginning of chapter six, one of those first videos I made for the chapter. I took a point, let's say x, y, reflected it over the y axis and said, well, when I do that, the x coordinate will change signs, the y coordinate will not. So what matrix will make that happen? Well, the x will change signs, nothing happens to the y's, no x to worry about in the second one, y remains the same. So if I were to multiply this by, I don't know, a point, what does that look like? How about 3, 4? So let's say I took this and multiplied it by the point 3, 4. I would end up with negative 1 times 3 plus 0, so negative 3. And then 0 plus 4 is 4. So maybe this is the point negative 3, 4. That's 3, 4. That's a tr transformation matrix that reflects x, y over the y axis. What if I want to do a reflection across y equals x? In other words, I want a matrix that will produce the inverse of a function. Well, that means we're doing a transformation that maps x, y onto y, x. When you reflect across y equals x, you change the coordinates. So if you think of it this way, w1 is going to be no x's plus a y. And W2 is going to be 1x and no y's, right? So now we're switching the x's and y's. We're not just changing the signs like we did up here. We're actually switching their positions. So a transformation matrix might look like this, 0, 1, 1, 0. In other words, we took the rows in the identity matrix and we flipped them. Let's try applying that to a point. Let's take the point 7, negative 2. So take 0, 1, 1, 0, multiply it by 7, negative 2, and I get what? 7 times 0 is 0, 1 times negative 2 is negative 2, 1 times 7 is 7, plus 0 is 7. And sure enough, what did it do? It took 7, negative 2, it switched the coordinates, and it gave me negative 2, 7. Right? How about expansions? We can do horizontal expansions, we can do vertical expansions. So let's first start with horizontal expansions. So I'm going to take my vector x, y, and I'm going to multiply the x coordinate by some value. Now this assumes that k is greater than 1, otherwise it's not an expansion. If k is equal to 1, <laughs> then you just get exactly the same vector you had. If k is less than 1, is a contraction. So I'm multiplying the x coordinate by some value that's greater than 1. So now it's going to go further out to the right than it did before, or further to the left if x happens to be negative. What will make this happen? Well, we're going to change the x coordinate. We're going to multiply it by k. So if I take my identity matrix and I multiply that first x coordinate by k, I'm going to get a k. Everything else remains the same. You notice that it's not multiplying the y value by that expansion factor. It's just multiplying the x value. Of course, if k is between 0 and 1, then I'm not going to get an expansion. I'm going to get a contraction. So that object will move closer together. How about a vertical? Well, now what changes? Instead of mapping the xy's onto kxy, the x's remain the same, and this time the y values get larger or smaller if I'm doing a contraction. But if I'm doing a vertical expansion, when I go up, what changes when I go up? It's those y coordinates. So a matrix that might represent a vertical expansion might look like this. This time the x's remain the same, but the y's are multiplied by some k. And again, just like before, if it's a contraction or if the k values are between 0 and 1, that's what you'll have a contraction. All right, let's talk for a minute about shear. Shear is kind of like a rotation, but the vector moves by amounts that are proportional to their x, y coordinates. So it's like a rotation, but the vector moves proportional to x, y. In other words, not an angle rotation. It's moving by a certain amount. So we can have two types of shear. The first type of shear is horizontal. Horizontal shear 
means that I'm taking a transformation that maps xy onto x plus ky y. So you're kind of going from here to xy, and then you're moving over that way to x plus ky y. So you're moving proportional to, in this case, the y coordinate. All right, so that's your shear. Maybe the original point was over here, and you move that way. So there's your horizontal shear. How does a matrix produce that horizontal shear? Well, it's going to be the same identity matrix, except that up in this top right corner where the y coordinate is, we're going to add a k times y. So you can imagine if I decided to, I'm just going to throw this here for a second, then I'm going to get rid of it. What if I had an x and a y like that? I would end up with x plus ky as my first entry and 0 plus y as my second entry. So the actual matrix that transforms it is this matrix over here. Now, then what does vertical shear look like? Just goes the other way. The transformation maps xy onto the, this time the x remains the same, and we add to the y a multiple of x. So what kind of matrix makes that transformation happen? This time, the first row remains the same, but we're going to add a k to the x's, so we put a k down there and a 1 over there. All right, so that will give me vertical shear that will move it up. This guy is moving it across. The vertical shear is moving it up, but it's moving it up proportional to the xy points and not changing something by an angle rotation. I'll refer you to your book for the rotations in R3, but you can actually rotate around the z-axis. by an angle, right? That angle is theta. So what do you do? Your new coordinates, your x prime, y prime, z prime, is going to be the product of, this should look somewhat familiar, cosine theta, sine theta, negative sine theta, cosine theta, but then it's got to be a three by three matrix. So what are we going to do with the other five coordinates? Well, there's zeros that go across here, there's zeros that go across here, and there's a 1 in that bottom location. And then you'll take that times x, y, z. In other words, when you rotate this around, the z value remains the same. By rotating it around the z axis, you're not changing the coordinate in that third dimension. That coordinate remains the same. It's only the x and the y coordinates that change. But the textbook has much nicer pictures than I can draw on here. And I told you this would be pretty short, and so it is. That's the end of chapter 6.